Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads Church. My name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are going to begin a series entitled Name Dropper. Anybody ever hang around people that are constantly dropping names? Oh, yeah, I'm at so-and-so. Oh, do you know I know so-and-so? Well, this week, we're, or this month, we're going to be actually dropping a bunch of names uh, every Sunday, but they're going to be names, uh, the names of God uh, that reflect the character and nature of our Heavenly Father. It's important to understand who our Father is and how, what He's revealed Himself, how He has revealed Himself in God's Word. Sometimes we have a misunderstanding of who our Heavenly Father is. Isn't that the truth? Did He do that? Did He do that? Because I grew up in a Catholic church, and I love the Catholic church. I still go every now and then and do mass and just come over here uh, because I just love the tradition of it. Uh, but growing up, I didn't have a right and proper understanding of who my Heavenly Father is. And so those early years, I was so thankful that my pastor took me under his wing. And one of the things that he did is reveal to me from Scripture the different names of Jehovah. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who is our healer. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And all of a sudden, the things, that the, 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 the wrong belief system that I had of who my father was, was all of a sudden being shattered and a true perspective and a true character and nature of who my father was really just emboldened me and helped me and get, set me up for, for success in the future. And so that's what we're going to be doing all month long. We're going to be dropping different names uh, that we find in scripture about who your heavenly father is. And I think it'll benefit you and encourage you and build you up and strengthen you, your faith. Because sometimes the exact opposite of what his name is being revealed in scripture, the exact opposite is what you and I are facing in life. And so we are right. It's like, wait a minute. The promise that you gave me, the name of who you are is not, is not happening right here, right now. And so you are at a crossroads in that moment. Either identify with your circumstances or you rise above your circumstances and by faith hold fast to God's word and who the Father said he is. He is your provider. He is your provision. He is what he says he is. He is I am. What does that mean? I am whatever you need. I am your provision. I remember we were uh, young in the Lord and um, we were brand new and I, was, I needed $400 for rent. Some of you guys have heard this story, and I was like, okay, how do I get $400? Sell a bottle? I don't know what I was going to do. So I read a passage of scripture, Psalms 37, 25. It says, I have been young, now I am old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. And all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. He's never forsaken his righteous people. Mm-hmm. Natalie and I, we just read that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So why are we going to be the first ones forsaken by God? I called my pastor, and I started sharing with him what I'm sharing with you. He's like, ha, 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 ha. he's laughing because I got it, and he saw that I got it. He goes, Marcus, come to Sunday night service. I want you to share that story. I'm like, okay. I didn't know what I was doing as a kid. And so it's testimony night, Sunday night. And uh, pastor said, Pastor Martin, it's not one pastor. He goes, Marcus wants to share something with you guys. I went in there and I told him, I was like, man, I'm in need. There's some stuff going on in my life. But I read this passage and I'm not going to be the one that's going to be forsaken by God. He will make provision abound towards me. I don't know how, but that's what he says he is. So I'm just going to trust him. By the time I got back, I opened up my Bible and there was three $100 bills in my Bible. I'm like, what? I needed $400 though. (laughs) I was thankful, but I was like, hey, God, you you shortchanged me $100. No joke, this is a true story. We leave, we go home. And we used to live at the Manor Apartments down here, you know, off of 123. And they have um, mailboxes with, we're the only ones that have a key in there, other than the mailman. And so uh, it was was 8.30ish or so at night. I open it up, and there was one piece of paper folded in three. And in that, I open it up, and there was another $100 in there. But there was a passage of scripture Passage of scripture says, Psalms 37, 25, I've been young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. True story. Natalie and I were just like, what in the world is going on here? This is true. This is the God who says he's he's your provider. He will provide for you. He will constantly do that. I remember uh, when I was first, uh, I used to work at SMI and I used to be a crane operator. This journey happened because I was understanding the character and nature of God and I was uh, recognizing he is my provision. It was break time, and 
I wanted to go get a Coke, and at that time, the Cokes were 40 cents. Remember, remember those days? It's the days when pagers were around. And I went down to the break, went to the Coke machine. I only had 36 cents. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to go ask my buddy for a nickel. And I heard the Spirit of God say, no, trust me. I'm like, trust you? Okay, I'll just trust you for four cents. I had to go to the restroom, went to the restroom, opened up the stall. Right there on the top of the toilet, there was four cents sitting on top of that stall. I'm like, what the heck? And I grabbed it, and they fell in the toilet. <laughs> Seriously. I went, I said, no, devil, those are my four cents. I want to get this coat. And man, it's just, I'm telling you, God will reveal himself to you in a way that he will brand his character and nature in your soul so that you will never forget the God that you serve. He wants to embolden and encourage you and build you up in such a way that you're not going to be moved by the tactics of the enemy. And so we're taking a look at some of these things here this morning. I had a misunderstanding of who my father was. But it was through the teaching of my pastor and through the scriptures that the Lord revealed himself who, was, who my true heavenly father is. And that alone has stabilized me, friends. I'm telling you, chaos comes, all kinds of stuff happens. But that right there is a staple inside of me. And that's what we're going to be doing for the whole month. We might be doing it for the rest of the year. I don't know, because I think it's going to be fantastic. You know, the scripture says in Proverbs 18, the chapter, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. There's all different ways God reveals himself. Either way it is, whatever he wants to reveal himself, it's a strength for you. It's a place you need to rally around. It's a place you need to, 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 to walk towards. It says the righteous, they run towards that. Opposition comes, you know, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe this is going on, Pastor Mark. It's like, run to the name. Run to the name. You're more than a conqueror. You triumph in him. You're not a defeated foe. The enemy's already been whooped. Rise up above that place. Walk, walk from victory, not for your victory. Amen. You're trying to get something that you've already been given. Amen. He already made the deposit. All you have to do is make a demand on that deposit. Yeah. You might be going through stuff. It's like, why hasn't all this stuff happened in life? Well, here's why. You need to allow faith to rise up in that place and quit shaming things and quit blaming people. And you, by your spirit, rise up in faith and just put a demand on God's word. You're not going to manipulate God anyway. I'm just saying you're, he wants to stretch your faith. He wants to make provision and make his name known to you. Why? It's important for you, but it's important for your children. It's important for your grandchildren. It's important for those that are around you that he's caused you to influence in life. And so we're taking a look at a passage of scripture here this morning in Exodus, the 17th chapter. And one of the names that I often rally around is the name Jehovah Nissi, who is the Lord, our banner. He is the Lord, our banner. You know, the banner is like a flag. And whenever you go to like a ceremony for the Olympics, you see it on TV. They go and uh, people represent their country and they're raising up this banner. There's flag. This is who I represent. This is who I, this is for my cause. And they're proud of those things. Or you go into the Spurs game and you'll see those banners lifted up high. It's a reminder that we're champions. You know, it's a reminder of, of those things that we need to hold fast to. Right? And so it's, it's something similar to that. And he is our banner. His name is going to be lifted up and he's going to remind you that he is your redemption. He is your deliverer. He is what you uh, have need of in in your life right now, in this moment. And so in this passage in Exodus, the 17th chapter, we find uh, the context of this passage is very important because the context of this passage is in the middle of a battle. Why is that important? Because you might be in the middle of a battle right now. You're probably in the middle of a battle. And there's something that took place in the midst of this battle that they were at overwhelming odds that God wanted to teach. He wanted to instruct some things that I think he wants to instruct in our lives. And so when I approach this passage, what do I need to know about this passage when I face the enemy in, in a battle? So I'm just going to read the passage, make some comments, make some notes, and then we'll go home and have some barbecue. Is that all right? Israel's deliverance had just taken place. In other words, for the last 400 years, they were in bondage. They were in slavery. Um, they were discouraged. They were defeated people. And finally, by the hand of God, he delivers them out of 400 years of slavery, and he moves them into or on their, their journey towards the promised land. 
They're about three months into their freedom. And three months into their freedom, an enemy comes. It was called the Amalekites. These guys were not schooled in, in warfare. They weren't schooled. They didn't have any weapons. They had just come out of slavery. As a matter of fact, they had a slavery mentality still. You ever meet people that have a, a victim mentality or slavery mentality? Yep. They can never see themselves. It's the inner critic that's just bombarding their soul, and they can never get past it. Why? Because of their thinking. Right. And God, by his spirit, wants to break that stinking thinking and get you into truth. So to fortify you and help you recognize the fears and the insecurities and stuff that come up in our lives. And he wants to just challenge those things and break that stinking thinking in your soul. And on this journey into freedom, they come to this place called Rephidim. Rephidim is a very important place because this is the very first time the battle takes place with God's children. And anytime you see something for the very first time, there's usually principles there that will enhance you, that will help you in your walk with himself. The Amalekites were about to face them. The Amalekites, when you look at the name, it means the dweller, dwellers in the valley. And what it represents to us here on this earth is that Amalekites are anything that opposes God's, um, God's system, God's way of, of, of advancing his kingdom. Anything, any opposition that you're facing that's trying to draw you back or make you quit and give up, that's an Amalekite. And you're going to slay this Amalekite this morning. Now, the beautiful thing is this. Well, it's kind of beautiful. It's kind of crazy. But the Amalekites were um, a, a descendant of Esau. You remember Jacob and Esau? They were a descendant of Esau, and Israel was a descendant of Jacob. So they were actually cousins. So it's a family fight. Anybody ever fight with family? <laughs> like, man, I ain't going over there. Not this Christmas. Not, uh, forget that. Not this Easter. Oh, man, it's Easter. I don't want their kids over here. They'll eat everybody's eggs. Blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> verse 7, I mean, verse 8, it goes like this. Now, Amalek came. No, go back. Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Point number one. Rephidim means a place of rest, a dwelling place of rest. And usually, it's right here. The enemy will always come when you, at the right opportunity, at the opportune time. A lot of times, it's when you're just resting on your laurels. When you're the most vulnerable. When you feel like, oh, everything's good, everything's awesome. Then all of a sudden, bam! Bam! It's the opportune time. 1 Peter 5, it says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary comes around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour, who he can put under, who he can make quit and give up and paralyze their faith. He might be doing that to you right now, but not after you leave this place. He's not going to do that. And so it's important. He comes to recognize when you're most vulnerable. Have a little self-awareness. When do you usually mess up constantly? It's usually you'll find a pattern in your life. For me, I tell Natty, the most vulnerable time for me is either Saturday night, I'm feeling pressure to communicate. It's not that I'm trying to put on a performance, but it's just there's just an element of pressure there. And, or Sunday night, after I've preached. Because a preacher, if you don't know this, a preacher preaches three messages. The one he prepares, the one he preaches, and then the one he wanted to preach. I always had the fourth one and the one my wife wanted me to preach. <laughs> and a lot of times, man, the, the, the critic just comes in in those moments and it's just like, oh, I'm, I quit. I fire myself. Then I hire myself on Monday. <laughs> Back again. <clears throat> now, notice this. When are you most vulnerable? You have to ask yourself. A lot of times when you're in a transition from one church to the next or from one city to the next or from one season to the next, you're the most vulnerable. Change transition, when financial instability takes place, when somebody's just giving you a bad report, there's a setback in your physical um, body or just things like that, you'll find out when you're most vulnerable, when your self-worth is being challenged. The inner critic, for me, the inner critic sometimes gets the best on me. The enemies are all out here, and I could care less. Why? Because I already know their place in my life. They're under my feet. Why? Because they're under Jesus' feet. But it's the inner critic that I constantly pay attention, pay more attention to than I need to. And I got to fight my way out of this place. As a matter of fact, there's something you don't know about me. I wake up in the morning six feet under a ground. I don't know why. I didn't ask for it. 
I, so I had to take the first moments of the day, the first hours of the day, and build myself up just to get on level ground. Why? I have no clue. It just, it's a, that's the tendency. Natalie wakes up like Tigger. It's like, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, when he, or Eeyore. It's like, it's going to be a great day. Is it? Really? <laughs> Verse 9, it says, And Moses said to Joshua, whenever they were at Rephidim, Choose some men to go out and fight with Amalek. He goes, I need you to go choose some men to go fight. Tomorrow I'm going to stand up on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And Joshua's like, really? He goes, we're going to go fight? Man, we just got out of slavery. I don't know anything about fighting. I don't have any weapons. You're going to go up on the hill. Yeah, in that safe place, I'm going to go fight these guys. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, but okay. Oh, by the way, he says, you're taking the rod with you? I'm taking the rod in my hand. Well, immediately, I bet some thoughts triggered. They recognized Moses when he had that rod. That was the rod of God that turned this rod, and he threw it down in front of Pharaoh into a snake and ate up the snakes of the magicians in that time. It was this rod that Joshua and all the people saw. Whenever he would lift it up, the Red Sea would part. Right before this story, it was the rod that God would use to strike a rock, or Moses would strike a rock, and water would flow because they had just spent the last three days uh, thirsting for, for, for water. It was this rod that made the bitter waters in Mara on this journey, the same journey, and turned them into sweet waters. They recognized what was happening here with this rod. It was the rod, when he would lift it up, that manna from Heman would come down. And so Josh was like, okay, take your rod. Joshua did as Moses said to him in verse 10, and uh, they fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So you got the idea that he comes up there, he's on the hill. Aaron and Hur are with him. And the, the fight, the battle is going on. And whenever he would lift up the staff, lift up the rod, they would advance. They would gain favor, and all of a sudden, man, they were taking territory. But old Moses, old Moses, he was, he was 80-something years old. When he got weakened, his hands would go down, he'd get tired, and then they would begin to get defeated. Get back up, Moses. Come on, get back up. Advancement would come. You get tired. I'd be like, it'd be fun to kind of have a game. Like, <laughs> go, guys. Oh, shoot, yeah, go. <laughs> and so that was kind of what was happening. And honestly, this is really symbolic of our, our, of our salvation. This rod had no power. It was the God behind this rod. It was God who was advancing his people to overcome the enemy. It was God who brings deliverance into our life. It was God through Jesus Christ, who, by the way, who was also on a pole. And if we lift him up, he'll draw all men to himself. It was, it was the representation of what Jesus and what Jesus did that actually was re being represented here in this story. A little bit later, you see that the children of Israel were getting eaten by snakes and bitten by snakes. And they were, some of them were dying. And then God told Moses, goes, get, get the snake and lift it up on a pole. And whoever ke keeps their eyes on that will get healed. What's symbolic of what Jesus, Jesus is, he, he comes from the rod of Jesse. And as we lift him up, the scripture says, as you are running your race, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and finisher of your faith. Amen. And so really, he's just kind of given us a, shadow, a hint of what's going to be taking place in redemption there on the cross. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. I was like, oh man, I see Jesus in every book of the Bible. And I see Jesus right here above this rod. And so we find it right here. It says in, in, in verse 12, but Moses' hand became heavy. Well, he's old. And so they took a stone and they put it under him. Sorry, if you're 80, I'm, I'm not saying you're old. Sorry, if you're 80. I just, went, I just went and played golf a couple weeks ago with a gentleman who was 84 years old. And man, he was kicking my butt. I'm like, wait a minute. You're telling me I can do this till I'm 84? Yes, you can. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm game. I'm on. And so it put it on, he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur, uh, that's, a fee, that's a male. I don't know why they named him Hur, but it's, it's, a, it's a male. They supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands 
were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeats Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Brings me to point number two. Don't fight your battles alone. Can't do it by yourself. There's a reason why Aaron and her were there to support Moses while he was, you know, standing there with the rod lifted up. Sometimes in the midst of the battle, listen, that took place until sundown. That's 14 hours of standing. 14, 12 to 14 hours. After 30 minutes, he's like, man, for me, it'd be like three minutes. Like, hey, help me. Just put a stick right there. And as long as his hands were up, but it was Aaron, Aaron and her that God would use friends, folks that, that understood this whole strategy, folks that under, maybe they didn't understand, but they were there to support him. And we need people to support us. Proverbs 18th chapter says, there are friends who destroy each other, but there are real friends that stick closer than a brother. Those are the kind of friends that we need in life. As a matter of fact, some of us here this morning, you're one decision away from creating a path in your journey that will lead you into victory. And you know what that decision is? Ditch your friends. Why? Because you win or lose by the friends you choose. Your friends determine the direction and the quality of your life, period. You tell me the journey that you're on, I'll ask who's, who you're hanging around with. And I can probably predict, for the most part, the way your journey is going to take place. I was talking to someone just a couple few days ago. And I said, listen, I know the path. I've done this hundreds of times with people. And I will give you the key to overcome and help you on your path. You can't see it. Let me be your eyes. Let me be your vision right now. Here's the one thing I want you to do. And don't come back to me if you don't do this thing. Lose that friend. It's just one person. You've been hanging around for 16 years. You need, this, this person just drags you down and defeats you and just thinks that you're self, selfless and just, just does things to you that, that cause a, a defeated mentality. And you can't see yourself in a victorious place. Why? Because that dude is constantly just, he's used of the enemy to speak lies into you. And here's the deal. You believe the lie now. Ditch that guy and then you'll start getting on your way, getting stronger. Because then I'll reassign uh, friends to you that will lift you up build you up, encourage you, bring you to God's word so he can help you overcome. There's three types of friends, I always say. There are friends that are always for what you're for. There are friends that are always against what you're against. And that's cool, but they're not going to last a while. They're only going to last a little while. Then there's friends that love you for who you are. They could care less of what you're for or against. They love you as a person. Joel, he said, I don't, you know, I could care less about the church, all this stuff. It's not that he don't like the church. He loves the church. But he says, I'm here for you. And I said, you know what, Joel? I appreciate that. You're not getting a raise, but I appreciate that. Because <laughs> I know that that's a true brother who's in the foxhole with me. And we need men and women and, and people like that that are just, that will just do battle with you. That they know you. Last night, man, this crazy opposition was taking place the last couple of days. Like, man, what is going on here? had a, an opportunity to just be shattered in my faith and just paralyzed. But I, I knew that was a tactic the, of the enemy. And let me just share this. Um, and I shared in the second service because this is, a, this is a way I evaluate. Natalie and I evaluate the opposition that comes into our lives. When stuff happens that all of a sudden it's just like, whoa, what happened here? Immediately we, we have a, 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 a check system. One, are we in rebellion? Or are we in willful rebellion against God the Father and his will for us? If that's okay, we go to the next one. Are, do we have, uh, in, with my wife or with or Natalie, with her husband, are we in opposing uh, ways? Do we need to repent? Do, are we okay? Do we have peace? Is our love walk strong with one another? If that's in check, then I tell us, like, is there anybody in the congregation that I have odds against? Is there anybody here that, man, I have a discrepancy and I need to make amends or I need to do something? And if all those three things are in check, then I know it's the enemy. I know it's the enemy that's trying to gain ground. And, that, and, and when I know it's the enemy, I already have the fix for that. Right. I speak God's word. I raise up the banner. The Lord God, you are my banner. You are my rock. You are my fortress. You are my deliverer. You are my strength. You are my conqueror. You are my triumph. You are my hope. You are my healing. You are everything that I need. You are my God. You are my counselor. You are the one that will help me navigate out of this place. Amen. The devil's a liar. Amen. And I'm not buying into his lies. 
We have the victory in Christ Jesus. I don't know how long it's going to take, but all I know is that this is the truth. And I will walk in this truth and stand on God's word. That's what faith is. I don't see it. Well, that's what faith is. You don't see it, but you believe it. You hold fast to that which is in God's word. He'll make himself known to you in a very, very special way. How? He'll put four cents on top of that toilet. (laughs) He'll do whatever it takes to ignite your faith and help you to solidify the belief system of who your father is. That's the one thing that really ticked Jesus off. It's like, this is not who my dad is. Quit misrepresenting him. This is who my dad is. And all through your journey in life, that's exactly what the Spirit of God will do. He might not say it in that tone, and sometimes he will. That is not your father. Quit blaming him. He didn't put that path in the way. He didn't put that wreck in the way. He didn't cause that one to die. (laughs) Well, who did? I don't know. I don't understand. But all I know is that he's faithful. I sat in this office when this used to be my office, discouraged and felt defeated and deflated. My youngest girl was getting a divorce. My oldest girl had abandoned uh, her children. And my middle girl couldn't have children. And I'm sitting there. It's like, Lord, what in the world? He goes, man, I've given myself, I've given everything to you. And this is what, this is what I get in return. And I remember the Spirit of God saying, Marcus, do I owe you anything? I dropped to my knees. I said, no, sir. I don't. You don't owe me anything. I owe you everything. In the midst of the divorce, in the midst of, you know, not being able to have children, in the midst of all this stuff, I will lift your name. I will exalt you. I don't care. I'll never have a harvest. I don't care if nothing ever goes my way. I will still worship you and magnify you and exalt your name forever. Why? Because you are worthy. I'll never let what's wrong in my life keep me from worshiping what's right about my God. Embolden your faith through God's word and God's spirit. He wants to do that in your life. Alert, alert when the battle comes, when it comes. Here are two things that you have to remind yourself that are so very important. When it comes, what you believe about God and who you're connected with makes all the difference. It really does. And we need people that will encourage us and build us up. So don't do the battle by yourself. And he goes on to say in verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this down. Sorry I'm so loud, but I just wanted to make sure you got that point. (laughs) Write this down. It's the very first time in Scripture that God asks someone to write something down. The first time. So for me, it was like, I need to pay attention to what was being written down. And so why? Because whatever is being written down in that particular passage of Scripture is something that I need to write down and remember too. You remember that time when your girlfriend gave you that phone number and you wrote it down on your, on your hand? <laughs> then you're all like sweating because she, she said she gave you the number. You're like, oh, wait a minute. Or the pager number, whatever that was. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time ago. <clears throat> it's important. Pay attention to what God is asking you to write down. Why? Because you need it for yourself and you need it also for your children and grandchildren because it's going to be a truth that will embolden your faith. Not only for you and your walk and your journey, but it'll also help others as well. Specifically, those that you have been given authority with. Your children and grandchildren. It really, really is important. Why? It's important for us to preserve those truths and to transmit them as well. Natalie and I have a, a favorite psalm, Psalms 37, 25. I have been young, now I'm old, never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. I cut out some wood, I, put that, I took that piece of paper out of the Bible, and I put it on there, I put shellac on it, and it sits there on my wall. Anytime we walk by it, it's like, I remember that. And there's no, there used to just be one story. Now there's tons of stories that are connected to that truth. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, recount it, he says, in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly, utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So here it is. So Moses writes something down. This is important. Why? Because this is what you and I need to write down. He says, and Moses built an altar, and he wrote, and he called its name, this is the Lord my banner. This is Jehovah Nissi, 
the Lord my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Third point, remember his name. Remember it. Hold fast to his name. The name Jehovah Nissi is the Lord your banner. And whenever you write Jehovah Nissi on your stick or on your wall or whatever it is you want to do, tattoo it on your arm, it's a reminder that this is who he is. I am your deliverance, Marcus. I am your provider. I am your guide. I am your counsel. I am your hope. I am your strength. I am your standby. I am your advocate. I am what, what I said I would always be. I am. Which is another name that we're going to be looking at here in about three weeks from now. I am what? I am whatever you need him to be. He's your provision. He's your guide. He's your deliverer. He's your strength. He is your power. He is your friend. I love when God just said, throw away all your friends. I didn't like it in the moment. He goes, I'm going to raise up other men that will speak life to you and will strengthen you and help you. Was it difficult? Yeah. Because my first friend, my only friend, other than my wife Natalie, was my grandmother. She was my best friend. And then God began to increase that in my life. And I've got some amazing, amazing, godly, God-fearing people. So this morning, here's your take home. And I know it's, it's simple, but this is so powerful. One, do not fear your enemy. He's already been defeated. A lot of people, they just magnify the devil. A lot of people just, their focus is on resisting the devil. Resist him. You know, take authority over him. And the scripture, when you look at it, there's another three words that are in front of resisting the devil. It's submit to God. Submit to God. Worship him. Lift his name up. Remind yourself of who he is and who he said he was going to be. You submit yourself to that God. You are already in a position to resist him. Amen. You already have overcome him. As a matter of fact, when you, 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 you lift him up and magnify his name forever, all of a sudden these things just don't, they just mean less and less. They just weaken. They just become weak in your, in your soul. And if you do that constantly over and over and over again, man, you're going to walk in a place of strength and confidence that's going to be attractive to people. Single people, how many single people do you have here? Men. All right, just men. Listen, you want a great wife? You want a good chick? Like you want a chick that really loves you? Understand who you are in Jesus. Walk in confidence of who God is. All of a sudden, that attracts me. Not that I would do anything to you, but I'm just saying. It's like, man, that dude, that dude is awesome. Why? Because he's not letting anything move him. He's not letting me, man, all the stuff that he's facing, he rises above it all the time. That's a pattern in his life. What is that? What's that about? What is that about him? And I'm telling you, that's what ladies want. Ladies, you look for a man, not because he's got a six pack. You look for a man because he knows the name of Jesus and he knows the word of God and he's in in alignment with God's word. That's the man you want. But he's ugly. I don't care. That's the man you want. I'd rather marry an ugly man who loves the Lord than a beautiful, awesome, six-pack, 12-pack guy full of muscles that is just a defeated, weak, blah, blah, blah. Why? You want to build a legacy that lasts beyond you. And the only way you're going to build a strength, a a legacy that's full of strength to the second generation, third generation, next generation, is by fortifying your, your, your belief system in who the God of this Bible is. Don't forget the banner over you is Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, your banner, who fights the battle for you. You don't fight for victory. You fight from victory. You're not doing stuff to try to get God to do something. God already did it. He already did it. You have to identify with what he's already done and begin to walk in confidence. But it doesn't match up. Just keep walking by faith. Do it again. Keep walking by faith. And all of a sudden, 
the, the, the stuff on the outside would begin to match what's going on on the inside. I promise you it will. I promise you it will. He is your provision. He is your counsel. He is everything that you need. Did I already tell you your take home? Did I tell you that already? I can't remember. I've done three services. Don't fear your enemy. If you're in a battle right now, don't fear him. He's already defeated foe. Number two, don't fight alone. And don't keep asking the same guys that always keep bringing you down. Get rid of those guys. Or at least just, just take a break from them. If anything, you embolden their faith. You speak, you, you call out greatness in them. They'll probably freak them out and they'll probably just cut you off. And don't forget that his banner over you, it's just beautiful. Let me just finish in Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter. Here's my battle cry. Here's something that I remind myself of. When you go into war against your enemy, when you're in the middle of your enemy's uh, tactics and schemes and see horses and chariots and soldiers far outnumbering you, in other words, man, it feels like every all hell is breaking loose. Stuff is just going crazy from everywhere. You're over and outnumbered. Don't recoil in fear of them. God, your God, our God, who brought you up out of Egypt is with you. When the battle is about to begin, listen to your commander in chief. Attention, Israel. Attention, Crossroads. Attention, Jeremiah. Attention, Joni. This is in a few minutes, you're about to go and do battle with your enemies. Don't you waver in resolve. Don't fear. Don't hesitate. Don't panic. God, your God, is right there with you, fighting with you against your enemies, fighting to win. I am Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, your banner. Amen. Listen, we need to stop whining and being cheesy Christians. <laughs> I don't know what else. I had other words to say, but I could not say that. We just, we are not weak people. We go through periods of weakness, but that's why you got friends. So you can back up in a place of strength. You're more than a conqueror. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. He defeated all the things and all the tactics that the enemy is trying to throw at you. Rise above that place. And it begins with your confession, with you identifying, oh, this is the God I serve. By faith, I will believe that and trust that. And you watch God do some amazing, crazy things. You know why I got these crazy stories? They're not preacher stories. These are real stories. It's because I'm crazy. I just trust them. I'm just like, okay, let's do this. And I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. All I know, it's going to happen. We will have the building that we want. We, that admin building, I don't care what the Seguin thing says. We will get the permits. All that stuff's going to happen. We will be in there, and we will continue to advance the kingdom of God from that place. Opposition constantly is coming your way and my way. But you can't allow those things to affect you. If anything, you run towards the name. He's the strong tower. The righteous run to it, and it's safe. Amen. Father, you are so loved this morning, and we're so thankful. Master, I just pray that help us to understand Help us to just get that, that you are who you said you are. Reveal yourself, manifest yourself, show yourself strong. All we have is this word, this truth, and I believe it. We trust in it. So whoever's in the battle right now, Father, I just pray that you lead them out of this battle into a place of victory, that they will know exactly what to do, when to do it, how to cut it off, how to make the phone call, how to break that thing. And Father God, you're so good to us. Why? Because you want your people to advance your kingdom. So we just trust you. Do what you always do, Lord God. Be Lord over our lives, over this church, over this city. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. Bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. We'll continue the series, all right? If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>